Welcome to this presentation about man-made leaky woody dams and do they actually work? My name is Angelique McBride from Quag Southwest and in this presentation I will discuss why, how and what we monitored and what we found out about some of our man-made leaky woody dams and the implications of our findings. So what are man-made leaky dams? Leaky woody dams are currently being promoted as measures for natural flood management by working with natural processes. These man-made leaky woody dams are intended to mimic naturally forming dams so as to reduce downstream flood risk by roughening up the in-stream channel and to also provide habitat improvement. Now there are many different designs for leaky woody dams across the UK, with some mimicking natural dams better than others. In Somerset, FWAG have agreed the principles of the design with the EA to replicate the key beneficial features of natural dams, such as allowing sediment, fish, and base flow to easily travel through while impounding water during higher discharge events. We monitored a stretch of a headwater stream that contained 20 man-made leaky woody dams, which were installed through the Heels to Levels multi-benefit project delivered by FWAG and funded by the EA. This stream, called Ford's Croft Goyle, is a headwater stream of the Marriott stream, which is a tributary of the River Parrot. The overall site is a steep wooded valley and the actual channel is relatively in size, so the majority of the water storage is in channel, with no water spreading onto a floodplain. The channel bed form contains point and lateral bars often associated with woody debris, which means that woody debris is a major control to the geomorphic diversity of this channel already. The channel at the site is relatively steep, and here in the diagram it illustrates the location of all the dams as well as the ones monitored. Five dams were monitored along this stretch. So what are the questions we wanted answered from monitoring these leaky woody dams? Firstly, we wanted to know do man-made leaky woody dams slow the flow? So do they affect the flood hydrograph peaks? Do they slow travel times of the flood peak? Do they improve and provide additional flood storage? Secondly, do man-made leaky woody dams affect habitat quality? So do they cause bank erosion? Do they cause siltation? Do they form scour pools and outwash gravel bars? Thirdly, from what we did find, what are the implications, i.e. what could be said about site selection? What effects would the site have on woody dams and vice versa? What can be said about the design of the dams? Is their effectiveness long term? Do they need maintenance and how much? Let's look at what we did monitor and how we monitored it. First, we monitored water levels using these water level dive loggers that would continuously measure the height of the water every minute. They were installed immediately up and downstream of each of the five dams. These loggers have been continuously collecting data for 18 months between January 2018 and May 2019. Then we monitored the physical channel form of the channel at each of the monitored dams. Channel cross section profiles were taken 1 meter, 3 meters, and 5 meters from the dam, both upstream and downstream of each of them. The channel long profile was recorded six metres upstream and downstream of each dam. And finally, we had a fixed point camera taking photos every 15 minutes of just one of the dams. This was Adam, the second to last dam in the cascade of man-made leaky woody dams. The substrate of the bed was also analysed from six locations, two control sites, one upstream of the series of the dams and one downstream of the series of the dams three sites within the influence of the monitor dams and one site under the influence of a naturally formed woody dam. So from the water level data, we set about looking at the flood hydrograph peaks. Can these man-made leaky woody dams modify the hydrograph peak? The hydrographs were normalized by calculating the water level increase relative to each logger's base level at the start of an event. And what we found was variability between the dams. If we look at a particular storm in March 2019 and between two dams, you can clearly see the difference of the upstream attenuation between Adam and Oprah. Adam does a really good job of storing that flood water for quite some time, whereas Oprah does show some water attenuation, but the falling limb quite quickly falls back to base level compared to Adam. The timing of the peak also shows variation between the dams. Looking again at the same two dams for the same storm event, Adam's peak occurred 38 minutes, 
before the peak downstream, with Oprah's upstream and downstream peak occurring at the same time. As mentioned, we found variability between the dams, but we also found variability of their effectiveness over time. In this graph, these points are the difference between the upstream and normalised peak, so the increased water level above base flow and the downstream normalised peak. So the number above zero shows the dams are storing more water upstream and are therefore being effective at attenuating water. These points were calculated for rainfall events over 20 mil. And what we can see here is that in winter of 2018, only a few months after the dams were installed, the effectiveness of the dams are fairly consistent and normally always effective at storing water upstream of the dams. When we then look at the rainfall events after summer of 2018, the dams showed variable effectiveness. Some of the dams showed increases in their effectiveness, like Deborah and Oprah, as can be seen here. But interestingly, Adam showed a reduced effect effectiveness, even though we um, have seen the dam is capable of attenuating water for longer. Now looking at the timing of the flood hydrograph peak as it travels through the stretch and past all the dams, we wanted to see if the dams slowed the travel time of the flood peak. However, after recording the time with Oprah kicking off the timer, it showed that each dam flood peak timing was hugely erratic, reflecting the complexities of a location as the valley contains many springs and an ephemeral tributary and also the varying degrees of debris trapping between the dams and over time. We sort of touched on how these dams are effective at impounding and providing additional water storage when we saw Adam attenuating quite a bit of water after a flood peak. Using the same rainfall event back in March 2019, we went about trying to estimate the bankfall storage area behind the dam. This is a time lapse video of Adam showing you how much water it attenuates behind or upstream of that dam. So from what we estimated, the average storage per dam was 5.77 cubic metres. And if you add that up for all the 20 dams across the stretch, that equals 115.4 cubic metres. This is assuming that all of the dams are utilising all of their upstream storage area. The 20 dams would be able to store 1.9% of the flood water in a 1 in 10 event. And you would need 100 dams in the stretch to be able to reduce the flood hydrograph peak by 10% in that 1 in 10 event. And that's just not feasible and would completely choke up the stream with woody debris. So to really make a difference to the flood risk reduction, we should be using other NFM measures like floodplain storage schemes. Moving on to the effects on habitat quality, we look to see if these structures cause bank erosion and to what extent this is a negative impact on habitat quality and also the stability and longevity of these leaky woody dams. Bank erosion was recorded at two of the five monitor dams, namely Deborah and Woody, as shown in the pictures here of Deborah and the channel cross section profile of Woody. This will impact the longevity of these dams, and it looks like they might soon fail. Another implication of woody dams is the buildup of silt behind the dam, and we wanted to see how much siltation could occur and the implications of that. Bed aggradation was recorded at two of the five dams. A large amount of siltation was detected upstream of Adam from the channel surveys with a maximum of 67 centimetres of aggradation recorded at one point as shown in this graph. So the midpoint of the vertical line is, is the dam, with the right hand side being upstream of the dam and the left hand side the downstream area of the dam. The particle size analysis confirmed that silt and sand smothered the entire gravel bed of the upstream impounding area of Adam compared to low silt and sand contents of two of the control sites. And this smothering caused localised habitat degradation. However, Adam siltation levels were similar to those found at a naturally formed dam downstream of Adam. Features normally associated with natural woody dams are scour pools and outwash gravel bars. 
and those features were recorded at four out of the five monitored dams. They were seen here at Deborah. Over the 18 months, this scour pool was created immediately downstream of the dam with an outwash gravel bar. These dams have therefore added to the habitat and diversity of the channel and these features are beneficial to a range of invertebrate and fish species. From our results, we have identified some implications for implementing these man-made leaky woody dams. For site selection, to really have an impact um, at slowing the flow, choose an available floodplain for the woody dams to push water into to increase storage capacity. Siltation from leaky woody dams may reduce habitat quality in gravel streams, but may improve habitat in salty streams by creating clean gravel outwash bars. Bank erosion occurred where dams were installed on a bend, Choose sites of straighter sections. Avoid stretches of highly mobile substrate as there is a risk of undershoot scouring, meaning that water just erodes underneath the dam, making the dam ineffective. For the leaky dam design, if you're worried about the site's sensitivity to siltation, make the dams leakier and more monitoring of the dam is required so that buildup of debris can be removed so that silt can be flushed out. As bank erosion was recorded and was causing an issue to the stability of the dams, it would be useful to choose a site where existing structures could be utilised for stability, like standing trees or perhaps using geotextiles like koi matting to stabilise the banks. Gradient is important for the design of the leaky dams. Shallow gradients with leaky dams will likely deposit more silt, as we have seen with Adam. Adam had a much more shallow gradient compared to the other woody dam sites. Make the dams for shallower gradients more leaky if you're worried about siltation, and less leaky for steeper gradients for greater attenuation. The long-term uh, longevity of the dams. So siltation upstream of the dams would cause the bed to rise and a waterfall to, be, to um, be created, reducing that storage capacity over time. Bank erosion would destabilize the leaky woody dams and create an offshoot. But it is important to note that natural Woody dams are not permanent features and they have a life cycle. They develop during normal flows, they then periodically fail during higher rainfall events. These man-made leaky dams have the potential to be washed away, causing risks to the downstream. So in conclusion, do man-made leaky dams slow the flow? Can they modify the flood hydrograph peak? Yes, they can. With some dams showing an extended flood recession limb, which shows attenuation of the peak flow. However, this was only seen in some dams. Do they slow travel times? Well, this was inconclusive because of the complexity of the site. Do they impound and provide additional flood storage? Yes, they do, but the degree to which is highly variable between dams and between rainfall events, reflecting the degree of blockages over time and the site conditions of the dam. We feel to really make a difference to flood risk reduction, leaky dams should be used in combination with other measures. And it's also important to note that the variability of the performance of these dams is at odds with the need for certainty and consistency for those at risk of flooding. Do man-made leaky dams affect habitat quality? Well, do they cause bank erosion? Well, yes, they do. We saw that at two of the five dams, which were ca causing stability issues. Do they cause siltation? Yes, one dam, Adam, caused a lot of siltation and smothered the natural gravel bed. However, rates were similar to a naturally forming dam just downstream. Do they form scour pools and outwash gravel bars? Yes, all the dams form scour pools and four dams cause, out, uh, cause outwash gravel bars. Leaky dams have the potential to provide localised habitat improvement, but also pose a risk of siltation and then therefore localised habitat degradation. As I have discussed earlier about the implications of the dams to site selection, dam design and the long term effectiveness, we can say that leaky dams are not a one design fits all site solution and dam, they need maintenance. And thank you for listening. From myself, Angelique from Fire South West, Sabine McEwen at Fire South West, and John Phillips at the Environment Agency. I hope you found this presentation to be useful and informative. Thank you.